Good evening, everybody. We're just going to give folks a moment here to get themselves connected and we'll be getting started shortly. Right. So it looks like we've got lots of folks joining us this evening. So welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. We're very excited to see so many people engaged in our fisheries webinars for this evening. We are talking all about harvest slot limits. So my name is Janine Higgins. I'm an engagement and education specialist with Alberta Environment and Parks. And for this evening, I'll be our facilitator for our session. So I also have a couple of other folks here supporting us in the back end, um, who's going to be supporting some of our technical aspects um, of this evening. So while we normally host these sessions in person, we're so glad to have technology uh, to support us and allow us to still gather online during these unprecedented times. Uh, today's meeting is going to be recorded and the recording will be posted um, to our engagement webpage and through our YouTube account. Um, tomorrow. So you can feel free to look for that if you're not able to stay for the whole session this evening. So to start off, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am joining this evening from Edmonton in Treaty 6 territory, and I acknowledge the many First Nations and Métis whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I honor and respect the elders of the past, the present, and the future, and I ask, since we're gathering from across Alberta, that each one of us personally acknowledges the Indigenous people of your region. So for this evening, we are going to be um, going through a presentation that we have on harvest slot limits for about 20 minutes um, from our lead presenter, Dr. Michael Sullivan, before we move into our question and answer session. So if you joined us last night, we're so thankful to have you back again this evening. Um, we will be spending about an hour on our question and answer before we close the meeting at 8.30 tonight. So for our question and answer, we are going to be using the same tools that we were using last night if you were here with us. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you can see there is a Q&A button down there um, that you can open up and that will bring up our, our Q&A session for this evening. So you can go ahead and click on that button that we have there. And if you have questions for this evening, you can go ahead and type them in there. So thank you for everybody who submitted questions to us through the Zoom platform. Um, we're again, so thankful to see so many people engaged for this evening. We are going to be going through four of those questions that were pre-submitted um, before we go into the live Q&A. So if you see questions that you would like to see answered, we are going to be using our upvoting tool um, for this evening. So because we have so many people joining us, um, we just don't have enough time to get through all of your great questions. So if there's a question that you would like to have answered, please go ahead and click that like or upvote button. So just a reminder that because we will have lots of questions coming in, please continue to scroll through the Q&A tool that you have on your computer or on your mobile device. Uh, to be able to see all of the questions that we have coming in. So for this evening, we will be focusing our questions um, on our harvest slot limits. So uh, same thing as last night, any inappropriate questions. So if we see um, anything that's inappropriate in nature, whether it be profanity or the question itself, we will be deleting those. Um, we are going to do the same where we're trying to answer as many broad questions as possible. So uh, diversity of questions. So if we have already provided an answer or responded to one um, and we're seeing a question come up again on the same thing, we will dismiss it so that we can move on to other questions. So fear not if we don't get to your question this evening, there are lots of other opportunities to still engage with our staff. So on our engagement webpage that we have there, there's an Ask the Experts section. So you can go and type your questions in there um, and also check out other questions that folks have been asking. So um, you can see other questions that have already come in um, and you can also sort through tags that have been posted there. So if you're only interested in hearing about walleye, um, you can go through and look at the questions that are just related to that. So I would encourage you to go and check that out um, if we don't get to your question this evening. 
So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. So we've got a great big panel here for you tonight of all kinds of folks who are going to be answering your questions. So as I mentioned before, our lead presenter is Dr. Michael Sullivan, who's going to be taking us through our presentation before we're joined uh, by the rest of the panel for the Q&A session. So for this evening, like I said, we've got a whole bunch of folks here. So we have Alicia and Ben, who are some of our fisheries biologists, Shane, Stephen, Jason, and Miles, who are senior fisheries biologists, Kadon and Jordan, who are our fisheries managers, Harvey, who is our facility manager of the Cold Lake Fish Hatchery, and then we have Matt and Dave, who are directors of wildlife health and fish and wildlife policy. So um, again, as mentioned, we've got a whole series of people here to answer your questions and we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we have allotted. So with that, I would like to pass it off to Michael, who is our lead presenter for tonight and who will be taking us through the presentation. Great, thank you very much, Janine. Am I coming up properly now? You betcha, you're sounding very, clear and good to go. Oh, very good. Well, appreciate seeing over apparently 300 people tonight. Um, welcome all, I'm speaking to you from the south bank of the North Saskatchewan River. I miss Guachiwaskihegan, the traditional territory of the Enoch Cree Nation and the Papa Chase Band. To me, that is more than a bureaucratic form that you check off, check off about an acknowledgement. These people, us, we all care about fish. I've been involved in a couple of ceremonies recently where the fish runs coming back to the North Saskatchewan River running up have been celebrated by the elders of those bands and others. That's a really powerful message that our, our fisheries are recovering. And I appreciate you coming tonight to hear some of the science behind how can we maintain these recoveries going on. Especially tonight, we're talking about these harvest slot limits. Um, the minister's vision described that um, we should be looking at more catch and keep fishing informed by science. That's the purpose of tonight is to inform you of the science around these catch and keep fishing. And the background is that over the past couple of decades, especially in the last decade, about 60 to 70% of our walleye fisheries are catch and keep. But that means 30 or 40% are recovering from overfishing. And unfortunately, that seems to be this pattern that we have overfishing, the fish collapse, we put in catch and release, the fish recover, we open it with a bag and size limit, it overfishes and it's back into recovery. It's this cycle of gets good, we collapse it, gets good, we collapse it. Is there something we can put in place to keep it good? So up to now for the last 20 years, the tags, the special harvest license seems to be a fairly good successful tool for that, but what other tools besides tags might prevent that cycle of recovery, overfishing, collapse? The, um, the harvest slot is an interesting option. We heard a lot about this at the public engagement sessions we did last winter. Uh, a lot of people said, hey, what about these harvest slots where you can uh, release a small one, release a big one, but take a small one home for, for eating. The idea is, can we get a balance between the recovery of fisheries, which needs catch and release, and gives us good fishing and harvest. How do we balance there between recovered fisheries but not collapsing them again? Because that's the goal, is to maintain sustainable fisheries in the long term. So what are slot limits? Pretty straightforward. Um, these are four sizes of fish. The small size in a harvest slot would be protected once the tail gets into that harvest slot area. That's the ones you can harvest. Once they get too big, you'd protect it. The idea is this allows the small fish to grow up to a moderate size where you can take them home. And it has to allow enough fish to get bigger than the slot for spawning and to keep the fishing good. It, clearly, this only works well if the angling pressure in the slot isn't so high that nothing gets through. If there's too many fish harvested in the slot, we don't get any big fish. We don't get very many fish in the harvest slot. We're left with just the protected small fish. We have to have angling pressure low enough so that enough fish survive through the slot and abundant young fish can grow into that slot. So in 2020, we tried this at quite a few lakes. We put a uh, slot 
limits on 38 fisheries with walleye, 19 for pike. That's 57 fisheries across the province. We tried slot limits. Uh, we're also looking at another 15 lakes that have these tags or the special harvest license that we're sort of using as a control for comparison to the 57 fisheries with slots. Um, we have about 185 walleye lakes, 500 pike lakes. That means right now with 38 walleye slots, about one in five walleye lakes is a slot lake. So there's, there's lots out there. We tried a couple different high sizes of slot limits also. I, I, I want to take a few moments to talk about the sizes. The sizes are actually not as important as you would think. Um, a lot of anglers, and we really appreciate this, have been making comments, hey, you know, it's the big fish that have the most eggs. That's absolutely true. Well done for, for looking that up. You know, a 45 centimeter, a young adult, a small adult walleye might have 60,000 eggs, where a big adult walleye, say 55 centimeters, might have almost twice that. So if you're managing your own boat and your own live well, and you have the choice between releasing a small adult or a big adult, obviously the best choice is release the big adult. This has more eggs. That's if you're managing your boat and the choice is one small adult versus one big adult. Tonight, we're going to be talking about managing the lakes where there is many, many anglers where we have, if you're managing a lake, the fishermen might catch a thousand small walleye. That's 60 million eggs. And only a hundred big walleye, maybe 11, 10, mil, 10, 11 million eggs. It's counterintuitive until you think of managing a big lake fishery where you want to protect the most eggs is actually protecting the small walleye. The small, the young adults are producing the most eggs. So a slot limit's only gonna work if you have few of those small young adults harvested versus lots of big ones protected. The slots work great if you have low angling pressure, which makes that work. So in 2020, we put, um, Walleye slots on these lakes in yellow. You can see them, they're spread from Montana up into the north and from uh, the foothills right over to the Saskatchewan border. We have 19 pike lakes. Those are superimposed on some of the walleye lakes. And we're also looking at um, 15 tag lakes. So we have slot lakes from Montana to the territory's border and the foothills of Saskatchewan available to anglers in all regions. You don't have to drive far to find a slot lake and really concentrated in Lakeland because that's where the lakes are. Most of the lakes in Alberta are in Lakeland. So obviously most of the walleye slots are gonna be in Lakeland also. Our initial monitoring that we began in 2020 and we'll be doing for the next few years, are really looking at two critical factors. Did angling effort increase? And did that increase cause fish to go down? So that's pretty easy to measure. We're going out to the lakes, measuring with on-lake surveys. Some of the lakes we have trail cameras doing photo surveys. And we're able to compare what we're seeing now, 2020, 21, and so on, in the, uh, in the slot years with the last 40 years of, of data at these lakes for effort. Did that effort cause a fish decline? Well, we're measuring the fish abundance with our standard index netting. And there we're comparing it to the same lake, generally one, two, three, sometimes four years ago. So we're able to see, did it decline from the recent, most recent data? So did angling effort go up? Well, here's a cool graph. This is angling license sales for the last 60 years in Alberta. <laughs> And you can see it had a, a great big increase through the 70s and 80s. That was the oil boom years. We had a big decrease right down. We put in the walleye regulations in here, the pike regulations, the tag limits. We've seen a trend up uh, this year was was along that trend line. It was high probably because of COVID. Uh, last year was, was a starkly low year. Ask Miles Brown about that. So provincially licensed sales, yeah, we're seeing an increasing trend, which is continuing. But at the specific slot and tag lakes, well, we did a lot of work. If you were at those lakes, you saw us. This picture right here is from Buck Lake. I took this picture. Um, many of us were out at the lakes a hell of a lot this summer. Uh, we conducted um, 
734 lake surveys, counted over 15,000 anglers. The estimated pressure was 160,000 anglers, half a million hours. There was one heck of a lot of field surveys went on this summer. The point is to find out whether there's few or more fishermen. If you have few fishermen, obviously you can have less regulated harvest. If there's hardly anyone going there, you can have a lot of harvest. If there's more and more fishermen, you need more carefully regulated harvest. In Alberta, that average line is about eight hours per hectare. So here's this line. If we're above this line, we're gonna require more than the average regulation. If we're less than that line, it's less than average regulation. So I'm about to show you a graph here with a bunch of blue dots on it. Each dot represents a lake in a year with lake size on the bottom part of the graph and angler pressure on the right hand, on the left hand side of the graph. So what we can see here is that the big lakes, places like uh, Pigeon at the surveys we've done is typically two, three, four, five, six hours per hectare. Some of the smaller lakes like a Garner or a Floating Stone might be 20, 30, 40 hours per hectare where you have relatively low pressure on these great big lakes, those tend to be the ones that are fairly sustainable. And where you have more pressure down here, those are the ones that we're having trouble with. So what does 2020 look like? Here are the lakes we looked at in 2020. So kind of across the board, um, some are high, some are a lot lower. At say Pigeon Lake, which was an SHL, a tag lake, Boy, from the long-term average at Pigeon, it had really gone up. Gull was a slot lake, it had gone up a little bit. St. Anne was a tag lake, it went up. Sturgeon was a slot lake, it didn't really go up. We've seen as high there. Pinehurst, it was kind of average for Pinehurst. Buck went up, but some of the biggest effort was actually at our catch and release lakes. So we know that fishing was really popular in 2020. We had about a 30% increase in license sales compared to the long-term average. We also saw about a 50% or a little more increase at the lakes, more people on more trips. This wasn't the biggest year in Alberta. It wasn't a record year. It was actually a pretty good stress test for the slots. <laughs> a lot of people went out. If the slots were going to work in this year, it would be a really good test for them. And the biggest test we were doing was this. Did slots attract more anglers? That's a critical question because if we only put slots on say 40 lakes, 38 lakes, and everybody concentrated on those lakes, well, that's not gonna make the test work. We're gonna have to spread the effort out. So did slots attract more anglers? If the slots didn't attract more anglers, they're already spread out, adding more slots isn't gonna help. So that was our key question from this summer. Did it attract more anglers? And mathematically, the answer was pretty clearly no. The slots didn't attract more anglers. Adding more lakes won't decrease the effort at these slot lakes. COVID, not size limits, was like the reason for increase. We saw an increase in duck hunting, cross-country skiing, uh, every outdoor sport bicycling increased as did fishing. And the biggest increases we saw were at tag lakes and some of the catch and release fisheries. People went to where the fishing was good. They didn't concentrate on the slot lakes, but there was a lot of people out there. And at those slot lakes, the angling effort, which is just the first year, so we're not gonna get too freaked out about it, was kind of near, or in some cases exceeded what we think is sustainable in the long term. So our yellow lights came on, our caution lights came on from this summer, but it's not a crisis yet. So did that increase in angling cause a decrease in, in fish numbers. We typically monitor fish in the autumn to find out what their abundance is using the standard technique that a lot of uh, jurisdictions in North America uses. And for this initial analysis I'm gonna show you tonight, I'm gonna to look at eight lakes, two tag lakes, kind of our control, and six of the slot lakes. So again, this is just the initial 2020 data. There'll be more and more to come. What we're looking for is how much did the slot fish decrease from the last time we looked at the lake? So we added harvest, obviously the fish are going to decrease. That's what harvest does, it kills fish. You got to have a decrease. A 10% decrease is just fine. 20%, mm, 30%, maybe that's okay, but it can't stabilize that. If we see more than a 50% decrease in the first summer, 
that's a much riskier situation, especially if it continues. So I'm gonna show you the data in the change in the catch from the last time we monitored these lakes to this end of this summer, just in the catch of the slot size fish. So these are the, the lakes we looked at. The y-axis is the percentage change. So the two red lakes are the tag lakes. The blue lakes are the slot lakes. And this black line across here, right here, is the 100% line, which means that if the bar was above it, so it's lax in N, we actually saw an increase in slot-sized fish at one of the tag lakes. At Pigeon, we did see a decrease in the slot-sized fish at a tag lake. These are the slot lakes. Remember, a 10% drop is okay, 20% is probably okay, 30% we're getting in the danger zone. So only one of the six lakes we looked at this summer had what we thought was kind of a safe decrease in the slot, sturgeon. All the others, man, that was kind of a risky decrease. It was more than or close to 50%. So again, this is just early data. Uh, most of these declines aren't, you know, the statisticians in me, <laughs> the statisticians in, in our community look at this and it's, it's not significant yet. So we're saying this is a, a caution. It's not a crisis unless the lake is already at a very low density, maybe shouldn't even had a slot limit put on it. That's a lesson that seems to be hard learned. Don't take harvest out of lakes that are low density. So it's a caution right now, but not a crisis. So the two big questions we looked at this summer, did angling effort increase? And did it cause a decline that's not sustainable? So yeah, the increase was it. Most lakes, not just the slot lakes. <laughs> we saw an increase all over the place. Spreading the pressure out isn't going to help. We're going to watch it in 2021. Maybe that was just a COVID increase. And the different numbers will be very different this coming up summer or even in 22. This is something we have to watch in the longer term. The decline we saw from this summer was more than we expected and more than we're comfortable with. It's a concern, but it's not likely yet a crisis unless the density gets very low. But again, this is early in the evaluation. Our conclusions aren't certain. You know, Mother Nature is always going to decide on these things. But uh, we're getting some really good data out there, and it's, it's coming in great. This is a really interesting experiment. So I appreciate that. Um, appreciate all the people. <laughs> I presented this like it was my data. This certainly wasn't my data. I spent a lot of time at the lake this at the lakes and rivers this summer. I probably have incipient skin cancer, but this was a real team effort. Uh, many of the biologists said this was the summer they'd spent most of the time in the field. So we talked to a lot of people. Um, fascinating the things we learned. And what we'd like to hear from you is what did you guys see in here uh, this summer? What were you expecting to experience? And what questions do you have? So thank you very much for listening and sharing. Janine. Excellent. Thank you, Michael, so much for that presentation. That was really great. So before we um, go into our live Q&A, which I see there's lots of questions that have come in this evening already, which again is fantastic, we will be going to the four questions um, that we have from uh, folks who submitted them when they registered for the webinar this evening. So I'll invite the panel to turn your videos back on and, and rejoin us here so that we can go back into these questions that we have here. And our first question was submitted by Gordon. And Gordon asks, are the current slot size regulations protecting our best spawners? Okay, hey, Janine, uh, I'll answer that. Uh, Steven Spencer here. Um, uh, good, good question, uh, Gordon. It, um, I, I think Michael covered this mostly in his uh, presentation, but the the important thing for a slot to work is that the fish can survive um, through the uh, protected, or sorry, through the harvest slot to uh, to get larger and produce uh, produce young. So that that's the critical thing, and that's the the what we're monitoring to make sure that the slot is appropriate for the lakes that we're looking at. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so the next question that we had that was pre-submitted was from Ben um, around Buck Lake. So are we not eliminating a whole group of age classes by allowing an open slot size? 
why not tags or control method? Hi, Janine, this is Miles. I can uh, weigh in on that one. Uh, so, uh, you know, Buck Lake is, is actually uh, outside my management area, but uh, I think Ben's question, and thank you, Ben, for submitting it, uh, is certainly applicable to any of the lakes where we are looking at uh, slot limits as a harvest tool compared to a minimum size limit or uh, SHL. Uh, so obviously, yeah, you know, slot limits do focus our harvest into a narrow range of fish. Uh, so the answer to your question, Ben, whether that's on Buck or, or other lakes, uh, can be yes. So if, uh, as Mike showed in the presentation there, if angling effort is uh, moderate or really high, and, and therefore we expect a lot of harvest and fishing effort in that slot, uh, the opportunity is certainly there to really depress any age classes that are inside that slot, meaning fewer fish actually grow and escape and get into that protected range. Uh, and if that plays out through time with enough time, uh, it be, kind of becomes a diminishing return. So in lakes where um, sustainability is gonna be heavily influenced by uh, the amount of effort, the amount of anglers and hours on the water body, uh, other tools like um, SHL or tags uh, have been an effective way for us to control that in the sense that it, it allows us to very strategically allow harvest, uh, calculated harvest in the population uh, while maintaining a, an abundance that we would attribute to uh, like a sustainable fisheries objective and sustainable level. Uh, and then in other situations, uh, minimum size limits have been very effective for us, as Mike also showed us in the presentation there, um, you know, protecting those three to five years of, of spawning uh, fish, whether that's walleye, pike, uh, whatever, does provide us with a huge egg mass that, that can support recruitment. Uh, and if you have low effort with a minimum size limit, we see this on lakes like Lesser Slave, uh, you can get fish out to 70 centimeters, which then gives a, a wider range for anglers to choose uh, where they want to take fish from. So um, it's an effort game. It's uh, how was the population doing when you applied the reg? Uh, and um, we monitor those, you know, uh, on a fairly frequent basis. And lakes we see as higher risk, we'll put more time into monitoring. Um, and, you know, the downside to those regs is if we uh, apply it and we don't get the chance to, to uh, assess it frequently, uh, we can see a pretty significant change in a fishery uh, in a relatively short time frame, um, and then obviously on the back side of that, we would take conservation actions to to see it recover and improve. Great, thank you, Miles. So our next uh, pre-submitted question is from Kenneth. So explain how slot sizes, or sorry, explain how slot size results will be monitored and contingency plans for adapting regulations to deal with changes. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, great question. That's what I'm showing you tonight is we will be monitoring two things. What does fishing pressure do at those slot lakes? If it concentrates at the slot lakes, cool. That's a tool, that's a piece of knowledge we can use to spread out the effort. So far this summer, it didn't concentrate. Did it cause the fish population decline? So far, yes. So we're gonna keep monitoring those two things. Angler pressure, is it concentrating and is it too high? And is the fish population declining? The adaption is, what do we do next if the slots aren't working? That's, a, that's the question. That, that, that's that's the, uh, the golden fleece we're trying to do. We can do catch and release. The fish populations come back up. When we open it up, especially in these small lakes, not the big lakes like Lesser Slave Lake, where a minimum size works great, but these small lakes, we want something to let people harvest some of the fish. The tags that we put in, so we started that in 2006, seems to have the best long-term success. We've had some failure with the, the tag lakes, um, tweaking the quota around. Maybe we had too high of a quota at some of these lakes, sometimes too low of a quota. But is there some other tool besides a quota the tags, just like we had on commercial fisheries, a quota, but this is a, a sport fishing quota. Are there other tools out there? Um, when I was a junior young biologist and had hair, I actually put uh, argued for slot limits on some lakes up in uh, Northeast Alberta. We had um, protected slot limits. And I thought the, my modeling showed that was a great idea. And the illegal harvest was so high, those fisheries didn't recover. So we learned from that. Now we have harvest slots. We're looking at illegal harvest on that, and that's a problem. So what you asked, can we adapt? That's what we do. So please, these are great forums, engagement sessions to tell us, hey, if these slots are too much pressure, 
uh, what are some of the options you guys can think of? I mean, we can make the, the slot smaller and smaller and smaller until it's like a, you can take walleye between 45 and 46 centimeters. But I think our officers would ask us what we were smoking <laughs> if we were to propose that. But tell us, come up with some new ideas. But our goal is the same as is our goal, your goal, our goal. Once we get these fisheries recovered, how can we open them up without collapsing them again? So that's our adaptation. We're going to monitor effort, we're going to monitor fish, and we're going to try to figure out a way to sustain fish with something other than in the tags. But the tags are working up to now. Thanks, Ken. Great. Good question. Thank you, Michael. All right, so we'll go to our last um, sort of pre-submitted question that we'll be going through and then we'll switch over to the live question. So this one comes from Gaitan. Uh, are we going to see more lakes open uh, with a slotted size? Uh, Hi, Janine. Uh, can you hear me on, on audio? I just uh, had some issues here connecting in and using my, my cell phone here. So just wanted to test that. You bet, we can hear you loud and clear, Jason. Perfect. So. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, Gaetan, uh, and actually one that I I heard quite frequently this year while out uh, evaluating uh, and engaging with anglers on the lake. So as Mike noted in his uh, presentation, uh, there were uh, 57 slot regulations, uh, 38 of, of those being walleye ones, and uh, 19 being uh, pike slots uh, within the province and, and scattered across the province as well, both on lakes and reservoirs. Uh, this is certainly more than enough to, to evaluate the slot regulation. And uh, again, it's important to keep in mind that uh, this is just uh, year one. Uh, so as such, you know, the intent uh, is for, for multi-year evaluation to properly evaluate and monitor in order to better gain uh, understanding of where and under you know, those various conditions and, and variables, uh, for example, the, the level of angling effort as to how those slot regulations work to maintain uh, fish populations uh, here in Alberta. Um, if you know slot uh, regulations are overly successful or if that success is uh, under certain conditions, uh, i.e. for you know on larger size lakes or with uh, less access points or more more remote, then yes, certainly slots uh, could be considered and applied where appropriate on, on some additional water bodies. And certainly that process would involve, uh, you know, future engagement and, and consultation uh, in order to do so. And then conversely, you know, if slot regulations were not successful overall in Alberta, or, you know, maybe they failed under certain scenarios. Uh, for example, if, you know, angler use is, is simply just too high and, and we're seeing uh, that angling effort uh, resulting in over harvest where simply fish are not making it through those harvest slot sizes to get to that protective uh, bigger size or if it's simply not working on, on smaller size water bodies uh, that too is just as uh, important and then changes would have to to be made to con with considerations to to management objectives and, and regulations so yeah great question uh, thanks for taking the time uh, to submit that while you're registering uh, for the webinar. And I'm sure, you know, many others on the webinar tonight uh, had that exact same question in mind. So thanks. Great, thank you, Jason. All right, folks, so we're going to move over into sort of the live Q&A portion of our evening now. So again, we see lots of great questions coming in and people using that upvoting tool, which is fantastic. Um, so the first question that we'll go to is from Ken. Um, and he is wondering, has there been any discussion around opening up a slot size limit on Touchwood Lake? I'll take that question. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, obviously, you could tell by the question feed tonight that Touchwood is uh, quite a popular lake. Um, so when we were asked to choose lakes last year to potentially put slots on, um, I did not put forward um, Touchwood Lake because we had surveyed it in 2019. And to be honest, the walleye catch rates were very low. Um, I would say just knocking on the door of uh, very high risk to sustainability. So I didn't put it forward as a, as a, as a choice to put a slot on. Because of its high popularity with both recreational and indigenous uh, folks, um, it gets a lot of pressure. 
Um, Tetra Lake, as you guys well know, is a very deep, um, not all that productive of a lake because of the cool temperatures. Uh, the data also indicates that we're not seeing a lot of baby fish moving up into the population. So we have a lot of larger, well, I wouldn't say a lot, we have larger walleye, you know, around the four to 600 range, but it doesn't appear that there's a whole lot coming up underneath it. Um, so that would indicate that there's likely some issues with recruitment. And because of that, um, you know, likely those four to 600 uh, millimeter fish are likely maybe one or two age classes, it'd be too high risk to uh, implement a slot on and, and to, you know, hope that, that would be successful. So that's why it wasn't put forward as a slot this year. But we will be surveying as we do with all of our lakes, um, regular monitoring schedule, hopefully, you know, within the three to five years, depending. And uh, if we see an increase in the walleye population, it will definitely, we'll take a look for next time. Thanks. Great, thank you, Alicia. Um, and just something to note too for uh, our panelists who are around the Edmonton area, it is quite windy out and we have had a couple people lose power and drop off of the panel. Um, so if you see people sort of coming and going, that's that's what's going on. So um, we'll do our best to deal with, with the lovely windstorm that we're having right now um, and hope that it doesn't interrupt us anymore. So the next question that we'll go to is from John and John says, good evening. In regards to slot limits, are there currently plans to put lakes such as McGregor, Crawling Valley, or Little Bow on a slot limit harvest plan? Shane, I can see you talking, but you're still muted. So I'll get you to unmute yourself there. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I did unmute myself there. Um, I'll take that question. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, I am down in Lethbridge, so uh, no wind issues down here. Um, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, to get back to the question, uh, I, I, slot limits at McGregor, Crawling Valley, and Little Bowl, um, I didn't put those forward last year because they hadn't been sampled for a while um, outside of Crawling Valley. Um, we, we were able to get to uh, uh, McGregor, uh, Travers and Little Bow in the fall of 2020 and sample uh, those reservoirs. Uh, the, the results um, that were recently put online um, show that they're probably not uh, in, in any condition with walleye populations to start offering uh, slot uh, harvest slots in them. Uh, we've, we've heard, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Michael's presentation and from other people about, you know, uh, the, the, the amount of angling pressure as well as, um, we do have some uh, uh, some issues with illegal harvest uh, at all of those reservoirs, and in particular at Crawling Valley, we we run into that uh, uh, quite often. Um, so uh, I haven't put them forward. I guess one one of the other things I should bring up too, for uh, in particular, um, when we talk about McGregor, uh, Travers, and Crawling Valley, is they're they're almost like, they're like one system. Uh, uh, essentially, they're they're one in front of the other from McGregor, Travers to Little Bow, and and uh, in the last number of years, probably four or five years, there's been a large construction project that has been creating a large canal between Travers and Little Bow Reservoir. Um, and as a result of that, those reservoirs have seen a lot of uh, water fluctuations in the last number of years in order to facilitate that uh, in order to facilitate that construction. And, and, and that and uh, for example, Little Bow has been drawn down uh, and, and McGregor and, and Travers uh, quite a bit more than they probably would have ordinarily um, and you know, I don't know. Uh, as as everyone knows, they're they're managed for a, uh, agricultural uh, use and and for irrigation. Um, but for the first time since uh, they were built, Little Bull Reservoir and Travers Reservoir will be operated as one reservoir. Um, that was, uh, which which is going to change things quite a bit. Um, so I think given we, that we have very high angling uh, pressure and, and, and that the results uh, in terms of the walleye sampling, um, what we uh, got in those results last fall, I, I had not planned to put them forward. Now, could in the future, maybe there's some tool we can use. I mean, it, you know, tags obviously was something that came to mind and was uh, talked about last year as well. And, uh, but we'll see, I guess, what, what things hold in the future and uh, where we go from there. Great, thank you, Shane. 
So the next question we'll go to is from Dale. Um, and this is a lake that I've never heard of, so I apologize if I completely uh, pronounce it wrong. <laughs> um, but Uticuma frequently winter kills. Why would we not have at a minimum a slot, uh, slot limit to harvest? Uh, hi, Janine, this is Miles. I can uh, take that one. Uh, and, and your pronunciation and pronounce it better uh, than me, probably. <laughs> is, is in super terrible. And, and I don't, I couldn't even say that mine is entirely accurate. But uh, as I know it, Utekima, uh, Utekima Lake is, is a fairly large water body for those that aren't familiar with it. It's just north of uh, Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, and and uh, so Utekima has a very interesting history, as, as Dale pointed out in the question. And thank you, Dale, for asking it. Um, Utekima has had a pronounced history uh, with summer and winter kills. Um, various frequencies and various magnitudes. Uh, and so in the past, huge volumes of fish have um, been harvested from the lake during those events, as well as uh, died naturally. So uh, for for some species, Utekima Lake has um, been very challenging for it to to reach and sustain anything that we would look at as a, uh, you know, moderate to, to low risk uh, population. Uh, so you take them uh, for its size, again, 28,000 hectares. Uh, for those that know it, it, it's a very shallow water body. The average depth is 1.6 meters, uh, and it has pockets of it that will get as deep as five or six meters. But uh, again, ultimately, uh, it's a fairly limited lake. So when we start to consider natural capacity to to hold walleye and, and provide a sustainable walleye fishery, uh, it's definitely going to struggle, will always struggle. Uh, on the flip side of that, the individual fish that are in there, as, as Mike talked about in the presentation, that sort of managing your live well versus managing the fishery, uh, there are walleye in Utikama that do reach old ages and uh, manage to fight their way through the gauntlet, uh, and they're beautiful, big, uh, mature fish. And, and so thinking about a harvest strategy there, uh, right now it has an objective of preservation for walleye. Um, the abundance is very low. Uh, it is very inconsistent in its ability to provide recruits. So uh, if you if you looked at it as sort of a size structure or an age structure, you would see one successful year class and then anywhere from two to seven years where no babies are actually successful entering that fishery and then another year class that is successful. So uh, it's very patchy. Uh, a number of years ago, we did some consultation after the last survey, which was in 2018. Uh, and essentially looked at it saying, well, there's two paths we can take here. One being um, preservation. We want to keep these fish around. They still provide a, a recreational opportunity. Uh, they're important to local indigenous fishers who also fish the lake. Uh, and we're essentially waiting on, will we see more of those almost bingo year classes come in uh, that might help us build um, a fishery underneath what's there for, for ma mature adults? Um, you know, obviously we haven't sampled it since then, so I'm not sure what's happened. But uh, at the time, again, abundance was very low. Uh, if we applied, so let's say if, so the other opportunity that would be there uh, when we look at our objectives would be something that would be more akin to like a liberal harvest fishery. Uh, again, the, the population is such, it's very high risk, very low density. Uh, any harvest would be difficult to say would be sustainable on, on walleye there, particularly in an open harvest system. Uh, if we applied a slot limit as a regulation um, in either, well, in the, the circumstances, liberal harvest, let's say, uh, the piece that would be tricky is commonly we look at slots and say, oh, their value is in protecting these big, large fish that produce eggs that have a high sport fish quality and you harvest fish within a window because the size structure in Utikama is very patchy. If you set the slot so that you're going to harvest fish there's a very low probability as it is right now that you're actually protecting any babies that would grow up and enter the slot or any of those large mature fish that you really want to hang on to. Uh, so it, it is uh, a lake where you could apply the reg, but I don't think we would be very forthcoming in saying that that, that regulation is managing for an outcome. It's not going to help us structure the population in a way that uh, helps achieve uh, an objective if that objective is uh, make more fish. Um, we could look at it from an entirely different lens and say, well, you know, socially we're comfortable. Yes, we, if we understand you take them a lake, it's going to struggle to sustain fish. Uh, and, and indigenous fishers also are comfortable saying, you know what, if they're not in my net and, and they're not a part of my harvest, uh, then perhaps we are okay saying, oh, let's change that objective, liberal harvest. Then it could be a consideration on fairly metering those fish out. Uh, but I'd be very cautious about suggesting that a slot limit there would be um, 
ideal for helping us achieve an objective if that was sustain or recover fish. Great, thank you, Miles. All right, so our next question comes from Ed. Uh, Ed says, good evening. Are there any plans to incorporate a walleye stocking program in conjunction with the slot size limits to help lakes that are unstable? This would be similar to other provinces that have had great success. Hi, Ed. Um, thanks for your question. I'm gonna take this one. Uh, as of right now, uh, we're looking to assess the effectiveness of slots in these lakes without any other adding any other variables into it, um, like stocking. So for the immediate uh, next five years, we're not looking to do any supplemental stocking on top of the slots. In addition, um, we try and be pretty judicial about where we put stocked fish um, within the province to try and minimize impacts to local genetics. But we do have some examples of lakes in the province where um, walleye populations have been established where they were not present prior. An example uh, is Snipe Lake. And if we had a slot that got put in there in the future at some point, and um, we saw decreases in populations, um, stocking on top of that could be a viable option. Uh, but at this point, and in the immediate future, we're not looking at uh, using stocking as a tool on top of a uh, harvest lot. Thank you. Uh, can I just add to that a little bit uh, as well, Janine? Um, in, in cases in, in the South where we have reservoirs and we have uh, uh, objectives that are you know more liberal harvest or, or greater amounts of harvest, uh, in some cases where we've made decisions to put a slot like like Chin Reservoir, for example, that couldn't, uh, it, it, it's, it's used so greatly by, uh, uh, by the uh, irrigation districts that it couldn't possibly uh, have a sustainable fishery, but people really wanted to have a slot size on it. it. It's possible in those cases where the objective is different than a sustainable harvest objective, we might put walleye into, into those locations. Thanks. Great, thanks Shane for adding to that. Uh, so our next question comes from Jesse. So do you guys gather any research or um, of ice fishing or just in the summer? I'm asking because ice fishing is more accessible for the average Joe compared to someone having a boat. Thanks, I'll take that question. Um, yes, we actually do do uh, creel surveys in the winter particularly. Um, we they tend to be sometimes maybe a little more intensive than the summer ones because you know folks can of course, there's more people out typically. And uh, of course, folks can access from more places than just boat launches. Um, so yeah, it requires us a little more effort on our part to, you know, drive around the lake and interview um, each individual group. Also with the uh, popularity lately of the ice fishing shack, I know there's a ton um, out on Lac La Biche right now that uh, that adds another layer of complexity. But yes, we do do surveys in the winter, um, particularly the creel surveys, asking anglers what they've caught, what they've harvested. Um, but uh, we don't do them as often, I would say, as our summer ones. But yes, we do do winter surveys. Thanks. Great, thanks, Alicia. All right, so our next question comes from Marty. Um, do you have slot size history from Saskatchewan or other jurisdictions where they use slot sizes or where they have used slot sizes for many years? And what does that history tell us? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, thanks, Marty. Uh, uh, absolutely, we do. Um, we read uh, scientific journals. We talk to colleagues. And uh, the, the really important thing is to make uh, comparisons that are, are similar to how it is here in Alberta. And, and when you start looking at Saskatchewan, they advertise on their website 100,000 lakes. We have 800 lakes here in Alberta. We, we don't have nearly as many lakes as, we, as they do in Saskatchewan. And you look at the number of anglers, we have more than double the anglers they have. So when, when it comes down to comparing to Saskatchewan, it's uh, apples to uh, giraffes. It's, it's very different here. And so, uh, um, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this, um, this assessment here in Alberta, so we will have that information. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stephen. All right, so our next question will go to Jacob. Um, 
in the lakes with a survey decrease of walleye and pike due to overfishing or otherwise, do the other desirable game fish such as lake whitefish or perch increase, especially over time? Yeah, Janine, can I take that? Please. <laughs> sure. That, that's a really good question. It speaks to the ecological imbalance. And absolutely, we can see changes in the community. We saw this, uh, if you fished in Alberta in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, when we had uh, really declines in, in walleye and pike at lakes like uh, Wabaman, where there's only a few big pike in the hot water effluent the predators were gone. The whitefish were small, they were stunted, and they would go through these boom bust cycles of tons of whitefish, and then they get skinny and razorbacks and collapse. Without predators, we can see these boom bust cycles. People saw it at Pigeon Lake without walleye or big pike. We saw the whitefish so stunted, the commercial fishermen couldn't even sell them to the Freshwater Fish Marketing Corporation. They're too small. Now, Absolutely, some people like that. They liked catching starving, stunted whitefish. I liked doing it because they were easy to catch. But by putting walleye and pike back in the lake or simply not killing them and letting them come back to the natural balance, we got rid of that ecological imbalance of no predators. And absolutely, there was a trade-off. People that liked catching, like me, like catching easy to catch stunted, starving whitefish, um, now have to go out in deep water and try to catch big fat white fish. But we have far more people fishing the big summer fisheries for walleye and pike than we did for the really stunted white fish. But an ecological imbalance doesn't mean we have to go in there and control it. An ecological imbalance is if we've overfished the predators and then we get these, these weird cycles. Um, I paid my way through high school working as a fishing guide at a lodge. There's a lot of walleye, there's a lot of pike, there's a lot of whitefish, there's a lot of perch. You don't have to control predators to have good fishing. Every lodge operator in Canada has never said, please put more commercial fishing at my lake and get rid of these damn walleye so I can have more pike or vice versa. The balance is when we take our hand off and let the populations come back. The imbalance comes when we push those predators right down. And there's a trade-off, absolutely. Whitefish fishing was easier when they were stunted and starving, but we have a lot more people fishing walleye now. That was the trade-off. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, so our next question comes from Jesse. So why don't we have more trophy lakes? I would like to see more no-keep lakes uh, that are already healthy. Jeannie, uh, uh, I can uh, take a swing at this one. Thanks, Miles. Uh, hi, Jesse. Thank you, great question. Uh, so one thing I, I wanna point out, which is really great is uh, I think this this is, as Mike and others here have described is the power and the value of these engagement sessions. Uh, one way for us to do that is actually to hear that from anglers and hear that from folks to say, hey, uh, I would like to see more of these trophy opportunities. I, I go through the guide and I notice there's only a few. Uh, that would align with things we've heard in the past from other engagements where folks have said, yeah, I'd like to see some in my uh, backyard, my region, my fish management zone. Um, so thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you to the folks that, that are also interested in seeing that. Um, I think when we have these uh, online surveys, uh, which uh, Janine mentioned uh, uh, at the start of the presentation there, that there's a link to, um, those are the kinds of pieces of feedback we'd like to see uh, in the questionnaires. And, and if there's another section and you're going, yeah, you know what, I, I know this lake. Uh, oh, wow, look, it is healthy and there's different options here. Uh, please express those opinions to us. Um, the walleye and pike recreational management frameworks uh, have a variety of objectives in them right now. Uh, trophy is certainly one of them. And um, as lots of folks have described here tonight, uh, if, if people would like to see more of those, that allows us as biologists, again, to talk about trade-offs there and go, that's great. Yeah, if, if there is broad public support for those trophy opportunities, uh, they'll likely come with limited harvest opportunity at the water body. But I mean, we know many anglers uh, aren't necessarily driven by uh, fish coming home with them every time they go fishing. So um, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear where you'd like to see those opportunities. Uh, and we certainly have frameworks that have this 
kind of portfolio of objectives in them uh, that allow us to to put those out there. Um, yeah, I appreciate the question, Jesse. Great, thank you, Miles. Um, so we have another question here from Andrew, which I think it might have already been um, answered, but I'll just read it out to the panel in case anybody wants to add anything. Um, so for lakes that currently require walleye tags for harvest, will these be considered for slot sizes in the future? For example, Pigeon Lake. Um, if so, what factors would be considered to make a change to the slot sizes? Hi, Janine, I can uh, take that one. So, yeah, I, I, you know, in that uh, fourth question that uh, we responded to about uh, seeing more uh, or additional slot size uh, water bodies in the, in the province, uh, yeah, again, we wanted to, to look at this as a, as a multi-tier evaluation and, and, and learn from, you know, and get a better understanding of those various factors and conditions and variables that uh, uh, make uh, harvest slots uh, a success um, or whether or not there are some concerns that we need to address uh, for certain water bodies. But uh, um, in terms of, you know, what potentially could make a, a lake a, a good candidate, uh, certainly the, the, the status of the population. So uh, having uh, a population that is, is naturally recruiting, we have various size ca categories to uh, of fish, so we have small fish, medium fish, and, and some of those larger fish as well uh, in hand, at hand, and then a good understanding of, uh, of use in terms of angling effort and, and some of those previous surveys that we can uh, rely on um, and, and note for, for some changes and, and differences uh, going forward. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, and yeah, we'll move on to the next question. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, so our next question we'll go to is from Paul. So how do, or how does genetics play into this? If the smaller fish are allowed to keep breeding, are we selecting them genetically to stay small? Yeah, Janine, I'll take, take that one. Am I live? Can you hear me, Janine? Yeah, yeah we can hear you, good. you're good to go. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And fisheries scientists around the world have been really looking at that. The general sense of it is to actually change the genetics takes decades and decades, if not hundreds of years and a heck of a lot more selective pressure than we have in Alberta. So we're aware of it. That's not a problem right now. There's enough fish getting through and spawning and we're not putting that length of time or selection pressure on to create that genetic bottleneck. But we are watching it as are other scientists throughout the world. So, so great question. Answer is not yet in these conditions. <laughs> Thanks. Great, thanks Mike. And um, so I see we have another question that's come in from Noah here. So asking about how slot limits are being properly enforced. Um, I've seen quite a few people ignore them completely, especially at Lac La Biche. So um, what we'll do with this question, similar to what we were doing last night, is um, send this off to our uh, friends at the Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Branch, or commonly known as FWEB, um, and we'll address this in our Ask the Expert tool. So you can expect to see an answer to that question come up. Um, on, on the tool in a couple of days to come here. All right, so, oh, I can see you talking, Michael, but I can't hear you. Oh, just to add <laughs> to add to that answer, actually a member of the panel did his master's. He was my first graduate student when I became a professor at University of Alberta and did his thesis on enforcement at size limit and slot limit lakes. And basically the answer was, you can add more officers, but only up to a certain point. And then we really need people to um, get educated and to call in. So adding more officers is not the answer. Does Jordan Walker want to answer any more than that? That was his thesis. <laughs> He gave you he gave you the okay sign so <laughs> okay it was a great thesis <laughs> <laughs> great thanks for adding that michael all right so our next question we'll go to comes from anthony or ace and this is a bit of a long one so bear with me while i read it i have been pursuing slot limits for you years especially for walleye the reasoning is that the larger fish that are currently rigs 
or that the current regs allow us to harvest tend to be the females. The larger the female, the more eggs that they have. Additionally, the larger fish are also the older and have demonstrated traits that we want to be preserved and passed along. While I support the government's desires to not have fish harvested prior to at least one spawn, my chief concern is a sustainable population that provides recreational opportunities as well as a reasonable harvest. I much prefer to harvest a 1.5 or two pound fish for lunch to being forced to keep a fish that is a superior breeder. The current regs have led to a collapsed fishery at Travers Reservoir and allows decimation of the breed stock. What is there so much resistance to having a slot limit of 45 to 55 centimeters, for example, uh, that would allow reasonable harvest and still preserve both the young that have not spawned and the trophy fish that are uh, far too large for dinner anyways. Janine, I can jump in and try to answer Anthony's question. Th thanks, Anthony. There's a, there's a fair bit to unpack there, and I'm going to try my best to uh, address a few of those points in there. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge that, uh, that Michael and some of the other panelists have probably spoke to some of the some of the aspects related to the biology of, of females, how many eggs they have, uh, et cetera, on that. And as well as the, uh, the understanding that effort is a big driver. And, and by effort, I mean angling effort on a lot of our lakes. Um, so the one advantage that we have and, and that we've put forward, and I think folks will see in our online surveys this year, is we do, and we talked about these a little bit earlier, different objectives for our, our lakes and our populations. So in, in many instances, what we look to have folks provide preference on is areas where things like sustainable harvest, where we're looking to provide more harvest opportunities. That might mean uh, that we're not necessarily uh, looking to grow larger fish. Uh, we're looking to uh, grow a, uh, a large quantity of fish for harvest. But there's other management objectives where we would like to try to produce quality or trophy type of populations. And in those cases, what we're trying to do is to keep some of those larger fish in the lakes, uh, see where we can have some of the genetics passed on from larger fish uh, going forward to keep Keep, to keep producing that. Um, so there is an opportunity, I'll, I'll plug our online survey a little bit, where uh, we do have a number of water bodies where we are looking to get preferences on some of those management objectives. That really will have an influence on the types of size and, uh, and catch rates that you'll see in some of those places as well. So, um, and with that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll speak to just quickly that slot limit uh, aspect. And uh, Michael spoke to this earlier in his presentation, Anthony, and I think the one thing that we see with some of these aspects is, is as Michael indicated, is where we have really high effort, a lot of times uh, what we need to do is really be careful and, and be really thoughtful about that that uh, harvest slot so that what we do is we get fish through that harvest slot, they can grow to maturity, they can uh, end up spawning and they can also be caught as, as large fish by individuals as well and enjoy that part of the fishery. So uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I hope I was able to uh, answer most of those, uh, Anthony. Great, thank you, Kate. We'll go to a short question next uh, from David. How many years to grow through the slot? I'll, I'll take that. It, it's a short question, but it's actually a little more complicated than you'd think. Uh, fish are um, much like us. There's individual variation in growth. So uh, some fish grow very quickly and obtain large sizes, whereas some remain small, uh, grow slowly, remain small, uh, even well into adulthood. One of the oldest walleyes that we uh, um, ever uh, aged in Alberta was a fish from uh, uh, Lake Athabasca and it was uh, 28 years old and only about 44 centimeters. So uh, the simple answer is one to five years on average, maybe, uh, maybe two to five years on average, uh, depending on the slot and, and the fish uh, individual growth and the lake that they're in. Great, thanks, Stephen. So our next question we'll go to is from John. Uh, can we have a slot size like 43 to 60 centimeters for walleye on Slave Lake? So there are measures to protect the big fish and increase the percentage of big fish in the lake. Uh, hi, Janine. Uh, I, um, uh, I don't mind taking that, that question there. So. Um, thank you, John, for, for asking that. Uh, and so some of this actually ties into uh, what Stephen and, and uh, as Kadon has just um, provided some insights there on uh, Anthony's question. So 
Um, we could evaluate something that would look like a, a slot limit at 43 to 60 on slave. Uh, and again, it, it, all the, the regulations themselves, again, all want or desire to tie back to an objective. What's that objective? What are we trying to deliver with that uh, regulation? So if we looked at slave right now that has a you know a minimum size limit of 43 centimeters, uh, we realize that at the angling effort that we have today, we get escapement uh, out well past that again up towards 70 centimeters. So uh, yeah, we you know if we looked at something like a 43 to 60, uh, we would say yeah okay well we're protecting you know 10 centimeters of those very large fish on the other end. Uh, again, those tend to be quite old as as Stephen had pointed out you know. Um, a little bit bigger fish, but uh, at that point, we're still looking at walleye that would be likely in excess of 20 years of age. So um, would that harvest window at 43 to 60 uh, really provide an opportunity for more fish to, to tick over 60 centimeters would become the question. Uh, and common theme, this would tie back to things like, what's that angling effort look like? Uh, if we saw a number of fish that were protected there now, that would be great. Uh, we know that they're towards the, you know, the older ages, the older ages in their life. Uh, and so we wouldn't expect to hang on to them for a long time. Um, and it would take a very long time. At 43 centimeters, most female walleye and in slave are kind of seven years of age. And at 60, they would be uh, deep in their teens. So, so it would mean, uh, you know, uh, probably more than a decade inside that slot. Uh, a wide slot like that likely wouldn't give us any more of an advantage than the existing minimum side limit. Uh, we could look at the smaller slots that we do have uh, out on the you know 57 lakes, 38 walleye lakes, I think uh, this year. Uh, and again, it, it just comes back around to what's that objective? What are we trying to deliver on? So um, it's something that we can evaluate. And uh, again, what's that objective? What are we trying to deliver? Does the tool uh, give us a better way to do that than what we're currently doing? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Hopefully that, that provides some insight back to that. Oh, Michael, I think you're muted. Double oh, unmute yourself, Mike. Yeah. Could I add to that, Janine? Please. Miles brings up a really good point on a slot limit. And whitetail hunters often say this, if you kill the bucks when they're little, they don't get big. So if you think about managing your boat, you think, well, I'll let that fish go and you'll get big. Tonight, we're talking about managing the lake. If the slot is too big, the fish don't ever get big. So what if 50 centimeter walleye are protected at Buck Lake? They're all dead at 47. If you kill the bucks when they're small, they don't get big. That's what whitetail hunters know. It's the same with fish. If you kill too many in the slot, we don't see any big ones. This big slot doesn't protect them. Keep that in mind. You're managing the fishery tonight, not your own boat. <laughs> Thanks. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, so our next question that we'll go to is from Deanne. So slot limits seem to attract inexperienced fishermen to these lakes for harvest opportunities. Is there any measure of the effects on fish populations outside of the slot size due to increased fishing pressure and poor catch and release practices? Hi, Deanne, um, I'll take this one. Thanks uh, for your question. Um, as, as you notice, there are different levels of experience when it comes to angling. Um, in this particular year, we probably saw an increase in new fishermen out there since and uh, anglers in general um, with the uptick in license sales and people staying home or getting out or trying new things with, with COVID occurring. Um, so encouraging people to learn about proper handling of fish is really important because incidental mortality from improper handling of fish. So long times of air exposure, um, rough handling on the ground, dropping them in the boat. These are all things that can lead to fish mortality. And uh, the, that type of mortality can um, impact fisheries over the long term. So if, if you see any illegal activities, it's really important to report that. So that could be through the report of poacher line. Um, and uh, our surveys that we do should be able to pick up on um, population size trends outside of the slot limits if there are decreases occurring above or below that would be a product of incidental mortality. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we encourage people to go to various websites um, like Keep It Wet, 
to learn about how to properly handle fish. So if you happen to run into any of these people and they're willing to have a conversation, uh, I recommend pointing them uh, to, to those sites or give them some tips if you happen to be a, a really good uh, fish handler yourself. Thanks for the question. Great, thanks, Ben. Yeah, we have uh, really increased our messaging around keep fish wet on our Facebook page. So I'd encourage you to um, go and check out our My Wild Alberta Facebook page as well as our web pages, as Ben mentioned too. So our next question is from Eric. So what was the purpose of opening up the walleye harvest at Gull Lake? Is it to overfish the walleye to allow the collapse of other fisheries to recover? Prior to any walleye harvest, 25% of walleye I caught were over 60 centimeters, 25% were 50 to 60 centimeters, and 50% were under 40 centimeters. This year, very few over 50 centimeters, none over 60 centimeters, and many under 45 centimeters. Hi, Janine. Yeah, I can take that uh, question here. So just, yeah, link me back with my cell phone here so you can hear me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, great observations, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, those uh, those observations certainly align with some of our, our index netting uh, surveys that uh, we've actually completed here uh, in some of the past years and just this, uh, this past uh, fall as well. So, um, you know, certainly the purpose of, of allowing some har harvest opportunities for, for walleye at Gull Lake was, yeah, we were, you know, that walleye population has been increasing uh, quite steadily when we first assessed it back in 2009. Uh, we did a follow-up survey in, in 2014 and then another one in 2017 and actually it uh, the Bali population grew uh, quite uh, quite well through that time frame and anglers were certainly uh, noticing that as well. Uh, there was, we were getting a lot of questions and when we were going to open it uh, we needed to allow for some some opportunity uh, because yeah Anglers were catching a, a wide variety size classes and some of those uh, quite uh, large fish as well. So yeah, we consulted with that in, in 2018, uh, implemented the, the special harvest license. So the walleye tags on, on Gull Lake to provide some uh, opportunities for anglers to harvest uh, some of those uh, walleye. Um, and then yeah, with respect to 2020, uh, that the opportunity to uh, trial uh, the slot size regulations uh, was also uh, brought forth and, and Gull Lake, uh, you know, certainly made a suitable candidate uh, for that given the, the status of that population. Um, and, you know, when we consulted last uh, last winter at this time, um, yeah, we, we had strong support for that as well. So that's, uh, yeah, currently where we're at uh, with respect to, to managing uh, walleye at, at Gull Lake. So yeah, thanks for that question, Eric. Great, thanks, Jason. So our next question comes from Lisa. Good evening. With the success of the walleye population returning on Lac La Biche Lake, it was positive to see the harvest slot size 50 to 55 centimeters open in 2020. Is there an opportunity in 2021 for the harvest slot size to be increased to 60 to 65 centimeters, being that most fish caught are larger than 50 to 55 centimeters? Hi, Lisa. I'll take that question. Um, Lisa, as you know, I know you fish uh, Lac La Biche quite often. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there are there is a big slug of fish on that outside of the slot size. Um, Lac La Biche was last surveyed in 2018. Uh, we, fingers crossed, have plans to uh, survey it this fall. So um, we wouldn't be making any changes for this spring, obviously, for it. But um, we just implemented that slot on it recently and I think it would be better if we let that sit for a while and just to measure the success and or failure of of that specific size slot on that lake. Um, it wouldn't be beneficial to the population if we start moving that slot around to uh, target those big peaks and fish but because Lac La Biche has got a pretty fast growing walleye population um, if there is sufficient recruitment being created from those big females on the outside of the slot that you're talking about, if those are successful at spawning, uh, rest assured we're going to have quite a few um, kids coming up into that slot in, in the future. So um, yeah, I think for now we'll, we'll keep it as is, but um, yeah, we should be seeing some coming up through the slot because as all intents and purposes, the slot is to protect those large breeding females. Thanks. 
Great, thanks, Alicia. All right, so our next question is from Robert. Uh, is there any thoughts to putting on harvest limits in put and take lakes? I fished, De fished DeWitt's pond with my grandkids and literally one to two weeks after planting the pond, it's empty. Could you uh, have lowered the take limits for the first few weeks after planting and gradually increase them uh, to the full limit, but it may be slow to slow down the meat fishermen? I'm sure this would work uh, in all put and take lakes. Uh, hi, Janine, I can, I can take this. This is not a, a slot, uh, but a, a, a question a lot of people have, uh, thanks Robert, uh, about our stocked ponds. Um, it is possible absolutely to change the harvest, uh, uh, the limits on, on, on put and take stocked ponds. Uh, we do have some examples in Alberta of that. Um, a lot of the, the put and take ones are just all stocked with trout and they're, they're designed for harvest. Um, I can appreciate uh, uh, that, that, they, that sometimes they do get, seem to get fished out really quickly. Um, in, in these cases, I know I've, I've been approached by a number of people in, in, in Lethbridge and, and Medicine Hat to, for stock ponds uh, and for the exact same thing. And, and, and you know, we, we bring that out to engagement and talk to people. And I think if, that's, if that becomes a, a sentiment by, by a lot of people, it, it's something we would pursue. So, so it, it is possible. Great. Thanks, Shane. All right. So our next question, and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, as well as from Powell. Uh, do you consider other species like perch? It seems since the major reduction in pike and walleye limits over the past decade or more has decimated any perch fishing opportunities on most lakes. Yeah, I can speak a bit to that, um, Janine. That's right, we did have We've, we've seen the perch populations decline all through the 1980s and 90s. We put in the walleye regs first, we put in the pike regs second. We tried to put in some perch regs right around 2000 as the third major sports species in Alberta. And we found there was no appetite amongst the anglers for conservation of perch. And it's a thorny one. A nice one pound perch is a 15, 20 year old animal you know how fast perch fisheries can get vacuumed out. As soon as people say Chippewan Lakes or whatever lakes is coming back with perch, all the pickup trucks go there and they get vacuumed out. This is a really thorny issue. So currently we don't actively manage them. It is all about trying to share. But if we get a lot of more interest in perch, um, we're very interested in we have a lot of data. We're very interested in putting forward good management on perch, but right now they're not being actively managed. It is just a, a sharing. We're keeping the bag limits fairly low. So we're trying to spread the sharing out, but absolutely perch is a valuable fish. And if a lot of anglers want us to manage it, we'll have to put in some serious conservation measures, but it is a thorny one, uh, not just <laughs> literally, but figuratively. These are old fish. A big perch takes a lot of years to get that size and can be easily overfished. Great question, thanks. Great, thanks. All right, so we'll go to a question here from Ray. Uh, could the angler census information conducted in 2020 by the government be shared with interested anglers? Thanks Ray for the question. Um, Yes, yeah, so that that, uh, that information was presented tonight in the uh, by uh, by Dr. Sullivan, and um, if uh, people want the um, the actual data, we, we would want a um, a data sharing agreement because we are uh, science nerds and we uh, we're going to take this assessment and publish it and get it uh, peer reviewed uh, to get it out into the uh, scientific literature. But uh, absolutely, uh, our information is available. Uh, with a um, data sharing agreement. Thanks. Great, thanks, Stephen. All right, so our next question here comes from Ted. So why can't AEP use both strategies, uh, slots and tags? AEP could allow every fisherman uh, to keep a slot fish or a number of slot fish per year. Tags would be general tags, not draw on the slot lakes. Rather than allow unlimited take per person per lake, it could be a limited per season. Um, I'll take a crack at that. Um, it is, that is an interesting uh, 
option uh, that we could potentially look into. If, if you think about the SHL program, it really acts like a slot, uh, the special harvest license program. It acts as a slot that's controlled with tags that get allocated out. So it, it could function similar to that. The tricky part would be um, ensuring that you uh, don't over harvest within that slot. As Dr. Sullivan mentioned earlier, um, anytime we have too much harvest in that area, it, it can cause problems. Um, also, we're currently working in a system where we're trying to reduce uh, red tape. And, and so adding uh, two regulation systems on top of each other um, causes a bit of complexity. Uh, so it, it's something we're trying to avoid, but it, it's definitely something we could look into, we could model, we could see how it might function uh, in a given lake uh, going forward um, if this became a, a more popular concept. Thanks. Yeah, I, I might just add on to that just a little bit too, uh, Ben and uh, and Ted. So I agree with Ben, uh, like really cool idea. Um, I think a couple of things come to mind, which is, um, you know, aspects related to where can you use limited harvest techniques and uh, and more open harvest techniques. So that could be a use of, uh, of an SHL type of system. It could be used with not only slot uh, slot sizes, but things like minimum size limits, et cetera. So I think as Ben indicated, there's uh, there's an opportunity to look at some of those things. Um, and maybe uh, Janine, I'll, I'll get another plug in here uh, that we are looking to get feedback on our special harvest license or our walleye tag system. Uh, we do have a webinar tomorrow night uh, and we've got some ideas uh, that we'd like to also get some input from the public on. Uh, I, I don't know that that one's in there, Janine, but uh, certainly we'd be open to uh, to seeing some, some suggestions. So I hope folks maybe are able to bring some of those tomorrow night as well. So sorry for the little plug there, so. Oh, that's great. The more, the more participation, Thanks, the better, right? <laughs> All right, so we'll go to a question from Greg next. Um, just so folks know, we just have 10 minutes left in our evening, so we'll go through a couple more questions before we come to a close. Um, but will Fawcett Lake ever be considered for slot limits or will it only ever be considered to be an open harvest limit, such as one over 50 centimeters? Uh, I can uh, take that one, Jeannie. Uh, so thank you, Greg, for asking the question. and. Um, so uh, the the short answer I would provide is, uh, yeah, we will look at different regulation opportunities on Fawcett Lake. Uh, right now it's on SHL, as you said, and, and the reason it's on SHL was uh, we were actually using that as a recovery tool to allow um, harvest to happen while trying to grow that fishery. Uh, so back when the tags went on, uh, the walleye abundance in Fawcett was uh, what we would characterize as a high risk to sustainability. Uh, it does have some great things going for it. it. It seems to be fairly consistent in recruitment. Uh, growth rates are, are relatively slow there, but uh, so it's taking time. But we are seeing response to that and, and uh, having talked to anglers out there and gotten feedback from it, uh, especially last year during our open house sessions, there were a number of folks that were were interested in what different reg opportunities on FOSA could look like. Again, with that trade-off being that, that the reason the tags went on and knowing what the, the status of the fishery was before, uh, Fawcett can uh, really climb in the amount of angling effort it has with the campgrounds that are on it and the um, the cottage community that's there. So uh, would we consider different regulation types? Sure. Uh, today, we've talked about how we're evaluating the performance of slot limits in Alberta. Uh, we want to see how they work in different effort scenarios to be sustainable, to deliver sustainable fisheries. So we, we need to know that. Uh, and once we have that data in hand, that's where we can then start to do these lake by lake assessments and see how that tool fits into our management frameworks. Again, with the idea being uh, objective driven, sustainable harvest or quality. Uh, and then we can look at what tools help us get there. Great, thank you, Miles. So our next question comes from Eric. How do you factor in seniors in license sales? Thanks, Eric. I can I can address that, I think. I, um, if, if I understand the question correctly, you're probably asking about how we track uh, seniors that, um, you know, both their angling activity and, and uh, the sale of fishing licenses or the participation of seniors in recreational fishing. So, you know, based on, uh, on that assumption, I can tell you that um, we do have the ability to uh, um, monitor the number of anglers that um, are uh, youth and seniors 
by through their uh, profiles on Alberta Realm. Uh, it doesn't give us a complete census of that contingent of the angling community, but uh, we can use that information to derive estimates. And the other thing we do is when we do creel surveys, we can uh, uh, ask people which age category they belong in or simply whether they um, purchased a license or not. And we can tell by looking at them whether they were exempt because they were too young to require one or um, old enough to not need one any longer. So we do have tools at our disposal that we can use to track the activity of seniors on the waters and uh, their participation in, in fishing activities. Thanks, good question. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, and unfortunately, Matt probably would have been able to add to that question, but he was one of the folks that we lost this evening, um, likely due to a power outage. So um, unfortunate for that, but uh, we'll move into our, our last question for this evening um, from Matt. And it's, what is the rationale of allowing bait fishing in a water that has a slot limit? Isn't the mortality rates higher with bait fishing due to improper fish handling? Uh, hi, Janine. I, I can uh, um, try to put something uh, out there here for an answer on this. Great, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, um, Matt, thank you for the question. And, and that's that's a good head scratcher, actually. Uh, so I, I think you're, you're probably, when you're talking about bait fishing, I'm assuming you mean like uh, the collection of um, uh, bait fish, like minnows and things like that. And uh, so we don't have an active monitoring program to look at a lot of the the forage based pieces that can be very difficult to track, uh, even when we want to look at trend data uh, within a lake. Um, some lakes we have had uh, opportunities to try to look at that in the past uh, with some success, but in others, uh, it's very patchy, very difficult. And I would say, as fish managers, we have very little that we can do where we could say we could actively make choices that would strongly influence. Um, what's going to happen with those bait fish populations. We've talked about already about uh, some of the uncertainty and consistency with things like walleye and pike recruitment. Uh, Mother nature can be very tricky. Uh, and so, yeah, it, why do we allow that? Um, maybe one of the things we can take from this is it's a good question for us to take back internally, look at our bait fishing policies, look at those regulations. Uh, and those are probably the things that also sit in our, our reg guide to say, oh, we, we know we have uh, these other pieces in the uh, sort of on, you know, on the desk surface to clean up. Actually, Miles, he was asking about why do we allow people to use bait when we have to release fish in the wintertime? Oh, I understand. Okay. So I answered a totally <laughs> that wrong was question. A, that was a great answer about <laughs> bait fish, but <laughs> he's we're right. Gonna, we're he, he's right that way. I miss. On yeah. the mic. <laughs> Take it away, Mike. <laughs> and I might, might not be the best first, but I think you're, you're bang on. If you catch a fish, especially pike, on a set line in the wintertime and he takes it deep, we do have higher mortality. And we're going to have to factor that in. And right uh, we've talked about that earlier. We can uh, reduce the mortality by restricting bait, but that really reduces the catch rate. So it's a tough social trade off. Yes. We kill fewer fish, but you catch a lot fewer also. But that's absolutely in the toolbox. And if we have too much mortality, that may, might be one of the levers we can push. Great question and not as easy to answer as you would think. That's a tough social lever to push. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan, though, for weighing in and actually answering the right question. And, and have, I like your the almost like answered answer. questions that people didn't ask. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> you know, this is this is why we have a panel and why we're here this evening. <laughs> All right, folks. So that does bring us to a close. So um, thank you very much for your time this evening and for all of the great questions and an interaction that we've had with you. We're so thankful for everybody being here. So again, the survey that we are collecting your feedback in is open until February 8th at 9 a.m. Um, if you can, you can find it just by Googling the 2021 sport fishing regulations. Um, and we also have a lot of other resources available for you there as well. So please make sure to check out the fact sheets. They are linked within the survey as well as on the water body map. Um, and again, we have that Ask the Expert tool that we are directing people towards um, if we didn't get to your question for this evening. So we also have a whole series of upcoming webinars. So if you enjoyed spending your evenings with us the last two evenings, you have two more nights 
this week to join us again. So tomorrow evening, we'll be talking about our special harvest license, uh, followed by the Native Trope Program on Thursday before we move into our regional webinars the next week. So please feel free to join us for those and sign up. Um, and again, all of the recordings for these will be posted on our uh, webpage and also on our YouTube account. So you can find it either way through there. And then lastly, again, we'd invite you to follow us on Facebook. This is where we do a lot of our, our education work and our communication work in terms of talking about what the department is up to and how you can get involved. And then, of course, we'd like to remind people that the Family Fishing Weekend is coming up in February. So you can expect to see some communications coming about that um, shortly here. So thanks again, folks, for spending your evenings with us. And uh, we'll hope to chat with you again soon. Have a great evening.